Good morning, Shabbat Shalom. Welcome to Hope of Israel Congregation. We invite you to stand and join us before we open a time of worship and praise as we pray together for the state of Israel. Together with me, please. Our Father in heaven, rock and redeemer of Israel, we ask you to bless and protect the state of Israel. Shield her with your loving kindness, envelop her in your peace, and bestow your light and truth upon her leaders, ministers, and advisors, and grace them with your good counsel. Strengthen the hands of those who defend our holy land. Grant them deliverance and adorn them in a mantle of victory. Master of the universe, compassionate one, Lord of justice, have mercy and deliver your children who dwell in your land of Israel. Protect and deliver them from the sword of their enemy. Safeguard them from death, protect them from danger, and shelter them from fear. Holy One of Israel, you who never slumbers nor sleeps, we ask you to set free all who have been taken hostage against their will by the terrorists and safely deliver them back to their families. We ask you to dispatch your ministering angels to each person who's been taken against their will to protect and deliver each one. Mend the broken spirits of grieving orphans, of grieving parents, husbands and wives, of grieving siblings, and of anguished friends who have lost those who are dear to them. Grant complete recovery to the wounded and the stricken and give courage and strength, hope and vision to your people and to your land. Manifest yourself in the splendor of your boldness before the eyes of all the inhabitants of your world and let everything that has breath proclaim the Lord God of Israel is king. His majesty rules over all. We ask you in the matchless name of our Messiah, Yeshua. Amen. Be amen. I want to just mention, uh, uh, people say, well, what position does Hope of Israel have? Well, we are Hope of Israel. You know, so uh, I'm Yisrael Chai, uh, B'Shem Yeshua, but I'm Yisrael Chai. And so we want to understand, we sent out a letter, the elders, in prayer this week, we sent out a letter to the community letting them know our position, that what is taking place is a, a defensive war as Israel was attacked, and therefore, according to scripture, uh, it is a just war, uh, and therefore we pray uh, for Israel. Uh, we also, as you know, we pray for the Palestinians. We love everyone. God loves everyone, we love everyone. Uh, but understand, we pray for victory for Israel over Hamas. Uh, we want the destruction of those terror organizations that are not only hurting uh, the Jewish people, but are damaging the Palestinian people too. We, we love everybody. And so we want to keep this matter in prayer. Uh, and, and we hope to see you tomorrow evening at five o'clock for prayer. And we'll be having other Zoom. We have been having Zoom meetings. Uh, thank you, David, for arranging that. We'll have another Zoom uh, prayer meeting this week. We'll have that every week while the war continues. Uh, because you say, well, what can we do? Well, prayer. Uh, prayer is the most important. It's not the only thing we could do. It's the most important thing we do. Uh, so never underestimate that. There's other issues, as we already noted, forgiving and other things like that. Uh, and some would say, well, uh, we want to just address some issues as best as we can uh, because our mess my message is, which, uh, by the way, I'm not going to Israel tomorrow, uh, for those who were concerned. I got a bunch of emails from people uh, and text messages telling, begging me not to go. Well, uh, I would go anyway, despite your begging, but they canceled all the flights, so I can't go. Uh, but one of these days, we'll be back there, don't worry. Uh, but in any case, uh, you know, when we think about Israel and what it is, uh, it is the promised land. Uh, and that's what we'll be considering over the next few weeks here. We'll be taking a look at what the Bible teaches uh, regarding the Abrahamic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant. God works in covenant relationship. Uh, you may wonder, how does God work? He works in covenant relationship. 
In other words, he, he fulfills faithfully his covenant promises. What he has promised in covenant is what he does. If you're unaware of what the covenant contains, unaware of the promises, you'll be unaware of how God will act. This is how God acts according to his word. And so we want our community to have a foundation as they interact with people. We know that many uh, of our members have been interacting with people outside our community and have been uh, taking it on the chin as people have been uh, misunderstanding uh, what our position is here. Uh, we care. We care about the babies in Gaza. We care about the babies in Gaza. And that's why the Israeli uh, defense forces have been communicating completely and, and thoroughly uh, with all the residents of Gaza to remove their children, to get out of Gaza City, to get out. Because we don't want those babies hurt. And therefore, it's the parents' responsibility uh, to take care of their children when there's a war going on. And we want to just address these kind of issues. And so we'll be taking a look uh, this week at uh, Genesis 12, 1. Uh, but we come at it, as you're aware, for the visitors here, I'll just let you know, we come at it from a whole Bible point of view. Uh, the whole Bible is the word of God. Uh, and so we want to understand it relative to that matter. Uh, we have some scripture to reach. We'll be reading this each week, uh, though we take different verses each week. And so please stand, if you will. Let's read the scripture here. We read the foundational promises of the Abrahamic covenant. These are the foundational promises that are exploded, developed throughout the word of God. But this is the foundational promises of the Abrahamic covenant. Let's read it in unison out loud. Here we go. Now Hashem said to Abram, go for yourself from your land and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I'll make you a great nation, and I'll bless you and make your name great, so that you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you, so the earth will be blessed. Father, we thank you so much for your word. Uh, we trust in it. Uh, the circumstances around us would distract us. Uh, we'd want to instill fear in our lives, anxiety, anger, but we look to your word. Your word is the foundation for our lives, for our families, and for our community. It's the foundation for the hope of Israel. And so we pray even now uh, for your protection and your blessing over Israel, but we pray also, Lord, for the destruction of Hamas for the deliverance of the Palestinian people. We ask for your blessing in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Okay, please be seated if you will. Uh, this, uh, the, you'll notice as I have for you kind of underlined the, the, the three points of the three promises in here. The promise of a land, the promise of a nation, and the promise of blessing. There's three promises in the Abrahamic covenant the rest of the scriptures explode these, develop these, uh, but we'll be taking a look at it one each week, Lord willing. Uh, and so we'll take a look this week at the first promise regarding a land. Uh, regarding the matter, I need to put things in context. Uh, there's eight biblical covenants. Uh, you can see where the Abrahamic covenant, you say, what's the difference? Some are conditional, some are unconditional. A conditional covenant uh, means that if you do this, uh, I will do that. If Neil Golub will, will, uh, will, will give me a hug, I'll give him a dollar. And Neil says, give me the buck. I say, first comes the hug. It's a conditional promise. You see what I'm saying? Unconditional is uh, he just hugs me with nothing involved. So thank you very much. But nonetheless, an unconditional covenant is based upon the work of God, what God will do, not conditioned upon the actions of anyone per se. And so we want to understand it. I have outlined there, uh, highlighted there, the Abrahamic covenant and the land covenant as well. But you'll see uh, the details that are on there. Now, we covered some of this when we studied in depth 
the Davidic covenant when we went through 2 Samuel chapter 7. Uh, but nonetheless, just for a reminder here of where this covenant fits in the pantheon of covenants, all the pantheons of covenants. We have a lot of covenants in the Bible. But I remind you, I remind you, God only works within a covenant relationship. He does according to his word, and his word was given relative to covenant relationship. And so understanding the importance of the Abrahamic covenant uh, for the picture takers here, uh, the covenant, Abrahamic covenant is foundational uh, to, as I mentioned, the land, uh, the people, the seed, and the blessing. Uh, so we want to understand that out of the Abrahamic covenant, uh, the land covenant uh, was given, uh, reiterated there in Deuteronomy 30 and elsewhere in the new covenant. Uh, it's uh, the people or nation or seed covenant, seed promise, uh, flowers in the Davidic covenant, uh, royalty, etc. cetera, uh, and uh, the blessing promise, uh, flowers in the new covenant. I know that many uh, church people uh, and those who are visiting with us, we welcome you. We're, we're thrilled with our fellowship together with you. Uh, and for those live streaming from various places where you go to church, uh, you'll find that in some churches, uh, what they do is they believe that the blessings are still relevant, but all the rest is no longer relevant. Uh, no, we're going to go over that, Lord be pleased, uh, but no, it's, a, it's, it's all together as one, as we'll see. You say, what's this got to do with us? Well, all this developed in Messiah. Understand the land covenant, as we'll look at it, developed into the promise of heaven and what God has for us heavenly. Uh, and then regarding the seed promise out of the Davidic covenant that flowered from it comes our royal st status uh, as kings, uh, etc., in the kingdom. Uh, and then uh, the blessing promise uh, developed into the eternal glory. And so as we take a look at this each week, we'll see through the scriptures how they're all identified, tied together, uh, so we'll appreciate its application uh, for us in this room as well as for the people in the land of Israel. As we consider the question, of course, uh, people are coming up with, I'm going to be, there's two things I'll be doing this morning. Uh, one, I'll be showing the relevance uh, and the revelation, but the relevance of the land being belonging to the Jewish people, to Israel. When we say Israel, we mean the Jewish people. Uh, and so that'll be the first thing to cover off. But secondly, I'll be showing uh, the application of faith that all of us have as we grow into the truth of it regarding where we're heading home to heaven. But nonetheless, uh, we want to understand first of all uh, that uh, whose land is it? It's Israel's by divine decree. And so we see initially what is just a land I will show you, what we read, uh, is developed uh, further on. And so uh, we see in here in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 7, Adonai appeared to Abram or Avram uh, and said, to your descendants, I will give this land. And so that was the very uh, first uh, expansion uh, on, on it. Uh, but then we move ahead. Uh, you say, well, how long is it going to be their land? Uh, okay, how long is it their land? And so uh, let's, let's read, if we will, the script. You're going to be doing a lot of How many people say, I want to do a lot of scripture reading this morning? Raise your hand. Uh, the rest of you, we'll see you next week. Okay. But let's read together the scriptures on the screen. Here we go. Genesis 13, 15. For all the land which you see, I will give to you and your descendants forever. Next. I will give to you and your descendants after you the land of your sojourning, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession. I'll be, understand it's, Forever and everlasting. Uh, if you're wondering how long that lasts, you say it's going to be forever. Uh, it's forever and everlasting. This is the nature of the promise. Uh, you say, well, what about when they're disobedient? Listen, we'll, we'll study, as we study the Word of God, you must understand for yourself as well. There are promises that we have in Messiah. Wonderful promises. 
that we only enjoy when we trust him. That we only enjoy when we trust him. There's many, so there are many promises. Israel, trusting the Lord, uh, not only had the land by divine grant, not based on their works, uh, but because of their works, they might be removed from the land at times. But the land would still be theirs. Uh, and so we want to understand what God is saying here, that despite any works on their part, this is the divine gift of God uh, to Israel, to the Jewish people, etc. And so for how long is answered? How far? How much are we talk about? Uh, well, when we take a look at what was promised, let's read, if we will, Genesis 15, 18 on how far. Here we go. On that day, Adonai made a covenant with Abram, saying, to your descendants, I will give this land from the river Egypt to the great from river to river. So I have up on the screen a map for you. And so you say, well, all those people should leave. No, no. When Yeshua returns to planet Earth, he'll deal with the boundary issues. Uh, but I'm just trying to show you that in regards to how far God had promised a land to them, uh, it is from river to river. I know modern scholars uh, try to narrow it down as best as they can for political reasons. And so they keep saying, no, it's not the river Egypt, it's the wadi. It's a little kind of dead stream there somewhere in the Sinai. No, the same word for river of Egypt is the same word for river Euphrates. No one ever talked about the wadi Euphrates of some little creek, no, not at all. So from river to river, but we'll leave the boundaries into God's hands. When Messiah returns to planet Earth, he'll deal with that. But the point of the matter is that the land that that the Jewish people uh, that Israel has right now is certainly sufficient uh, from God, that this is a gift from God. Uh, and you can see that uh, you say, well, is it occupied? Well, we might actually think other people are occupying. We might think somebody else is occupying what God has gifted us, but we're not going to get huffy about it right now. And someone says, well, why is Israel uh, you know, occupying uh, the West Bank? Uh, let, me, let me just speak to that for a second, your undivided attention. Following World War II, are you with me? Following World War II, the United States Army occupied Japan and Germany. You say, why? Because they had wanted to destroy us. They had attempted to destroy us. And therefore, they were occupied until they were safe, until they no longer wanted to destroy us. If it was up to me, and very little is, we would be occupying very thoroughly every dangerous area uh, within the borders of what is Israel uh, until they would be safe and they would not want to destroy us. But Hamas, Hezbollah, and Palestinian Authority have in their charters as their mission statement to destroy Israel and every Jew. Understand that by their existence, they are living to destroy the Jews. And so therefore, there needs to be an occupying force until it's safe. And everyone would understand that if you thought about it, especially the people in Japan and Germany. Moving on, if I may. And so we want to understand how it was confirmed. I'm not going to read this for the sake of time. I'm just letting you know that to both Isaac and Jacob, uh, he constantly reiterated the matter. Of course, you can take pictures. Uh, this is a free country. Uh, but nonetheless, it was reconfirmed, repeated uh, to Isaac and to Jacob. So it wasn't, so no one would think it was just to Abraham, but not his rotten son Jacob. No, no, even Jacob, it was reconfirmed to him. Why? Because it was unconditional. It was unconditional. It wasn't based on the works of Jacob or anyone else. It was based on an unconditional promise of gift of God. And we want to understand that this is how God works. And for those who are saved by unconditional promise in Messiah, you should thank the Lord for it. That's not by your works that you are saved either. And so what about the new covenant? How does it refer to the land? Uh, let's read, if we will, Matthew uh, chapter 2, verse 19 through 21. 
Let's read that section together. Here we go. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel. So Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. Stop there. Understand, at that point, it was Judea, the Galilee, and Samaria. It wasn't technically called the land of Israel. But in God's sight, it was still the land of Israel, even with Rome occupying it. It was still the land of Israel from a new covenant point of view. It's still the land of Israel. Let's read from Hebrews 11, verse 9. Uh, verse 9, here we go at the bottom of the screen. By faith, he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same. The writer of Hebrews, writing about 68 of the first century, the year 68 of the first century, uh, he understood it was still the land of promise. He, it was still understood as the land of promise. The new covenant understands it as the land of promise and the land of Israel. And those who follow the new covenant should understand that and not quibble over these matters. This is what the new covenant writes. You say, but hold a second, what about Yeshua? I'm glad you brought him up. Regarding the Messiah, Isaiah 8.8 8 states, uh, regarding the land, will fill the breath of your land, O Emmanuel. What? It's Emmanuel's land. He's the king of the Jews. Therefore, it is his land. He is sovereign over it. And if you're going to say it's no longer belonging to the Jewish people, you're taking it away from the king of the Jews. You must understand the way the Bible reads. And therefore, regarding the promises we are reading, regarding Abraham and promises for us as well, it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, I'll read this one, we'll read together the last one. It says in 2 Corinthians 1, 20, For as many are the promises of God. How many are there? From cover to cover. For as many are the promises of God. Uh, in Yeshua, they are yes. In other words, Yeshua is the fulfillment of all promise. They're all about him if you understand the Bible correctly. And therefore, to say it no longer is applicable is to therefore deny his fulfillment of the matters. And so let's read now together on uh, the bottom of the screen, Romans 15, verse 8. Let's read that together. Here we go. For Messiah has become a servant to the circumcision on behalf of the truth of God to confirm the promises given to the Father. When Yeshua came, listen very carefully. This is very important to understand. When you, this is written by Paul, of course, when you, the apostle to the Gentiles. What did he want Gentiles to understand? Let's understand together. When Yeshua came, he came as a servant to the circumcision circumcision of Jewish people on behalf of the truth of God. This is the fulfillment of what God had said, that the Messiah would come uh, from the Jewish people. And he came, therefore, to wash Jewish feet when he did. Uh, understand what he came to do. He multiplied the loaves for Jewish people. He came as a servant to the circumcision. But in coming, even though he was rejected by the majority of Jewish people in the day, about two-thirds of the Jewish people did not accept him as Messiah. Despite that fact, the very ministry, the very work he performed, understand what his coming, his work, his service was to confirm the promises to the fathers, not to conclude them as if fulfillment meant it's over, not to cancel them at all, but to confirm the promises to the fathers, the very things we read at the outset of our service of our time together here. Understand, he confirmed them. To say the land no longer belongs to the Jewish people is to deny what the New Covenant for our visitors, what the New Testament says from cover to cover as well. 
So we want to appreciate the simple fact of this matter. Uh, then when we say, you know, uh, the land belongs to Israel, it not, has nothing to do with any kind of ethnic chauvinism. It has to do with repeating what the Bible states. It has to do with what the Bible says. And so when you're talking to people and say, well, I think the, uh, the Palestinians were there before the Jews or whatever, you have to say to them, it has nothing to do with residency. It has to do with what the word of God says. The word of God is clear on the matter. And therefore, we take our stand on the word of God. We're not trying to justify what a government does, Israeli government or our government. There's enough to complain about every government. That's not the point. The point is, what does the Bible say? Despite the governments of the world. What's it say about your salvation? Despite your works. Despite your works, you're saved by faith in Yeshua. Because God's word says so. Therefore, we stand on the word of God regarding this as well. And so what do I, what do the promises, how do they apply to me? We're going to take the rest of our time to understand that if we have time to do so. And so regarding the land, uh, the land, the physical land also represents a heavenly land. Read with me on the top right of the screen from Hebrews chapter 11. I know this is a lot of Bible reading. It's more work than you're used to. Uh, don't worry, you're getting your devotions out. Uh, a little late in the week, but still for next week maybe, okay? Let's read Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8 and verse 16 together. Here we go. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive an inheritance. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. In other words, the land of Israel was a foreshadowing of a greater land, the heavenly land. This is what was in the mind of Abraham, the writer of Hebrews says. This was the deep desire, a city made without hands, what God has done. Understand we want to appreciate this issue moving forward for our lives as well. And when we understand the faith of Abraham in going to the land, we'll understand our faith in going to the heavenly land. There's a direct correlation. That's why the new covenant says, you are by faith, you're children of Abraham. We'll see the direct correlation here. And so as the earthly land is a gift, so too the heavenly land is also a free gift in the Messiah. You say, in the Messiah? Hold on a second. What are you talking about? Yeshua, the Messiah of Israel, is the key to understanding the whole Bible, John 5, 39. It's all about Mashiach. It's all about the Messiah. And Abraham was living with the hope of Messiah. You say, Sam, where do you get this stuff from? I read my Bible, don't you? Let's read the middle verse on the right. Let's read the middle verse on the right from John 8, 56. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was, he was looking unto Yeshua. Even as we are running the race that is set before us, looking unto Messiah. Even as we are running the race set before us, looking unto him. So also Abraham, having the promise of Messiah, was looking to that promise. And therefore, it was Messiah he was running towards even as we are. It was a free gift for him. It's a free gift for us as well. By faith in what God has provided, who God is. All gifts are received by faith as we surrender to his call. Messiah is the call of God to Abraham and us. It's all about the Messiah. For in Yeshua is all that God has ever promised. As I have read, we read before uh, from 2 Corinthians 1.20, as many are the promises of God in Yeshua, they are yes. And that he is also our amen. It's yes from God through him. It's from us, amen, to Yeshua, to God the Father. So we want to understand how this works together as we appreciate what God has for us. As he was going to the promised land, so are we. And if you deny one, you deny the other. 
as we'll see, they're inextricably attached together. Let's move ahead, if we will. As Abraham, the pattern of faith in his calling that looked to Messiah, we see our calling in Messiah. And by that same faith as Abraham, we are all children of Abraham and inheritors of the promise, what was promised and provided in Yeshua. We're going to grow together now understanding what it means when the New Covenant writes uh, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12, that the Gentile believers are now, listen, members, citizens of the commonwealth of Israel. This is what you need to understand the application of what was written there. You're part of the commonwealth of Israel along with us. That's why you celebrate Passover uh, and, uh, and uh, High Holy Days as we did and Sukkot, etc. Uh, and why we also have the promises for our life as we look forward to Messiah's kingdom of Israel. Moving ahead now, the outline. By the way, before I get there. In 2019, uh, Israel's ambassador to the UN, uh, Danny Danone, uh, what he did at the UN at the Security Council, he held up a Bible uh, and he said <laughs> to the Security Council, the Bible, this is the deed to our land. I like that guy. I like that guy. He happened to be correct, but he's speaking truth to power which we're called to do. So let's understand, if we will, surrender to God's call like Abraham, faith that surrenders receives. Surrender to God's call. He was sent by faith. He was separated by faith. He was shown by faith. Uh, let's understand for our own life the application of this as we walk by faith, as we have the faith of Abraham, O oh, you children of Abraham, B'nai Abraham. Uh, we want to understand the faith that we express as we follow Yeshua. And so, lech uh, lecha uh, should be translated, uh, go for yourself, uh, go for you, uh, as we'll see. Go for your soul, as it says uh, in the, in, uh, the Midrash Rabbah, uh, but nonetheless, go, lech lecha, go uh, for yourself, as it should be translated. Moving on, let's understand his call. The call of Abraham was not essentially to leave, although it may seem that way on the surface but to believe God. You see, first he had to believe God, and when he believes God, then he left. See, leaving is part of believing. When God asks us to leave sin, the old self, the old world, whatever, it's because we believe God to begin with. But what in believing is also the idea of leaving. And so for every follower of Messiah, when we're called to believe in Yeshua, it's intrinsically understood that we are called to leave. We're told to go, go, make disciples of all nations. That's what this congregation exists to do, uh, to be a disciple-making mechanism. Uh, people will glorify God and exalt his name uh, and, and be an instrument of his grace as well. And so, therefore, understanding this matter, uh, as he was told to go, so we are told to go. Uh, we are, therefore, to be planting congregations. I'm still praying for a new congregation to get planted on the north side of Charlotte, as well as the work I'm doing around the world. I'm still praying for this area, as many of you are. Keep that in prayer. We're to be going, making disciples of all nations. This is the calling God that the Messiah gave to a bunch of Jewish uh, disciples and everyone else, too. And so, in Messiah... We go to the Jew first and also to the Gentile, as we understand how the call breaks down, Romans 1.16. And so by faith, uh, Abraham, he went looking to Messiah. He was glad to see Messiah's day as he saw. And so also as we trust in him, we have what we need to go. It's by believing in him you are then empowered to go. It was by faith in, in God that Abraham was empowered to go, looking to Messiah. This is the key issue. Trusting in him. This is how you get what you need in your home and in your marriage. You say, well, he promised that he would never, never walk out on me. He would never leave me. Beware of trusting dogs. Be careful. If he's trusting in Messiah, then he'll be able to follow through on that. If he's not trusting in Messiah... Be careful of accepting what people say. It's only faith in Messiah that gives you what you need to be the kind of husband or wife that God called you to be. Everything else is just a bunch of commercial advertisements. 
And so understand, we have what we need. In him we are complete. We can therefore go and be an instrument of grace wherever it might be. And that's what we are called to do as well. And so like Noah after the flood, when you read how all these kings came about, the calling upon Abraham, like the calling upon Noah, Noah had his calling following the flood. And so following the judgment on Babel, the Tower of Babel, following the judgment on the Tower of Babel, Abraham received his call uh, in the sense this is the new beginning that returns God uh, returns to God's original plan for humanity to get the blessing. God had created us to be blessed, uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, but because of sin, we lost the blessing. This is the renewal of God's plan for the humanity, and not only for Jewish people, for all people. God loves us all, as we'll see as we study through the sections. We'll appreciate that. But nonetheless, this is God's calling that's fulfilled in the Messiah, blessing for all people. Uh, and therefore, the command, the lechtacha, uh, has to do with his priorities. When you see a command in Scripture, for those who are new with us or live streaming, take note of this fact. When you see a command or something put into the imperative, a command in the Bible, lets us know God's priorities for our life. We're not legalists. We trust God. But we understand his priorities because he put it in the command, which is a point of action. In the command is a point of action. And therefore, we understand it as his priorities for our life. And that's how we live. And so these are the priorities for us uh, as citizens of heaven. We're on our way home. We know where our citizenship lies. We are strangers and exiles on the earth. And how many people here can agree with me? Listen carefully. I am homesick for a place I've not yet been. I am. That's, see, you have eternity in your heart. You are created, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11. You are created with eternity in your heart. You'll never be satisfied by this world. You'll never be satisfied with what this world can provide. The only thing that is meant to satisfy your life is what God has for you. You are homesick for a place you haven't been yet. We're on our way. This is where we're going together as we trust in the Lord. And so just as Passover, as I'll mention a couple of times, just like at Passover, uh, we leave at his command because we're free. Because we're set free, we can go. Because we're set free, we can therefore be living our life to the glory of God, pressing on to the mark of our high calling. And so we respond to him, to receive from him. Therefore, faith in Yeshua follows him. All believers, you say, well, I'm a believer, but I'm not yet a follower. I'm not sure what you mean by being a believer. Because once you come to faith, you now have from him the grace that is all sufficient. Through weakness, his power is made perfect. His grace is sufficient for you. You have what it takes to be a follower. If you are believing, if you merely said a prayer 25 years ago and you say, oh, I don't know about being a follower, I'm not sure what that prayer was about 25 years ago. Because what should have happened is that you therefore came to faith in Yeshua, his finished work. And in doing so, you have a relationship with God. And in that relationship, abiding in him, you will bear much fruit. Abiding in him, you'll be empowered to follow him, to follow the word of God, to do as God has called us to do, to be a, a faithful husband, a faithful spouse, a faithful wife, be faithful parents, faithful children. This comes by the power of God so we can follow him. Like Abraham, we go, go for the sake of your soul. And so we live ready to leave. If people want to say, what's the next stop? Uh, beam me up, Scotty. I'm ready for the upper taker. Come quickly. Uh, and therefore, you know, uh, if the Lord comes before the war ends, I'll see it from a higher vantage point. That's all. But nonetheless, I'm leaving, living to leave, just like Abraham. His whole purpose in life, at 75 years of age, he had not understood his purpose. He, not, not like, he probably kept busy, but he didn't know what life was all about. At 75, God said, go. He now knew what his purpose was. He now had purpose by, based on what God has done. 
And so also, if you're 75 years or more, you want to understand your purpose comes from God. Not for what pays well, not for what you're appreciated for. It comes from God. And therefore, we go and we make disciples of all nations. We are citizens of heaven, and we eagerly await him. And so, therefore, we trust in the sacrifice of Yeshua. We die daily to ourselves and to this world. And so we're either going forth or we're sliding back. Those who know these things, they possess the promises of God. Praise God. The second thing I want to cover, now on the heels of that, surrendered to the call, he was separated. Not just sent, but separated. And so the whole idea of having the line on the screen regarding the text from your land, from your relatives, from your father's house, from, from, from. A threefold separation we want to understand that applies to our life. Uh, let's understand together. Uh, when you are set apart unto God, it's called sanctification, but that means you are also set apart from everything else. Separation. Let's understand that for our life. Uh, are you still with me, everyone? Yeah. You're, still, you're, you're hanging in strong here? I know this is information heavy, but therefore, I, but I trust that you can handle it. Here we go. And so the word from used three times here has to do with threefold separation. That is the result of going. For those who trust God, who step out of the boat, who believe the Lord, who follow Yeshua, uh, those who are sent are set apart in their service. And the fact that the three froms, from, 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 are all attached by the vav, by and, 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 in other words, the three are one. You say, hold it a second. How can three be one if you bundle them? But the point is that the idea is that they're all one. In other words, you don't get to choose which ones you want to separate over. You have them all bundled as one. There are three aspects of separation when you follow, when you trust, when you depend on the Lord here. And so let's, let's understand together whether you're, if you're living by faith or trusting in the Lord, uh, you're truly going is therefore going to be revealed. How is it revealed? What's my testimony? I'm trusting the Lord. When I'm separated from, I'm trusting the Lord. How's that seen? When I'm not living for anymore. Now what I'm living for is the Lord. Let's understand these three areas of separation very quickly if we can. First of all, from your land, from your land, Eretz. I know many of the translations say from your country. I, I chose the word land here, Eretz, because uh, God was making a point uh, in the scriptures uh, from, your, from your land to my land. Uh, Eretz is used twice in the verse. And so understand here, uh, Abraham, from your land, a new loyalty. Abraham would never fight on behalf of Ur or Haran, uh, but on behalf of this new land. In Genesis 14, he went to war with Mesopotamian kings uh, on behalf of the land, and even on behalf of the people of Sodom. You say, what? Yeah, we actually believe Sodomites have the same rights as everyone else, by the way. Uh, and, but understand, uh, because anyone who has rights has rights based on being in this country, not based on their morality. But he fought on behalf accordingly and brought the Sodomites and his nephew Lot uh, back accordingly. And so as a citizen of heaven, I have a new loyalty. I have a new loyalty to the Lord of heaven. I have a new loyalty. You say, but Sam, uh, aren't you a patriot? Uh, don't you care about your country? Listen very carefully. I fought for this country. I was in Vietnam for this country. I care about this country. I care about this country on behalf of the living God. I serve this country on his behalf. I therefore say to this country, stand by Israel. And it's not because Israel needs you. It's because when you stand by Israel, you're on the right side of history and eternity. And therefore, it's not Israel that needs the United States. It is the United States that needs to stand by Israel to have the blessings of God. And every one of us should be bold enough to be able to say the simple truth that this country needs to stand by Israel. You say, but many people are for others. I don't care. And you shouldn't care either. We care about the things of God. Why? I'm under new loyalty. I am under a new loyalty. And I think that makes me a better citizen, by the way. I think when I care about this country according to the word of God, 
I'm caring about the right things about this country, not the wrong things about this country. And so let's understand this new loyalty. And so I care about this country as he directs me to care about this country. And while I'm in this earthly country, I live out the values of my new loyalty. I'm in fact a citizen of heaven. Therefore, I'm forgiving people. I'm therefore going to be praying for my enemies. I'm going to be caring about those. Those who curse me, I will bless and not curse back. I will bless. Why? Because I'm under a new loyalty. I am loyal to, uh, loyal to a value system of eternity that I live out in the here and now. And so are you if you've trusted in the Messiah. And therefore that we love our enemy, we forgive those who despitefully use us, we pray for those, we bless them. We are a different kind of people group. All to, we're a new creation as it turns out. And so it says from your relatives, uh, your moldet. Abraham had a new community. And so the word Moledet, relatives, depending on how it's translated here, means kindred, refers to the close community you grew up in, uh, etc. And so I have a new community, the body of Messiah. You say, well, what do you mean? At the Nadler family reunion, I get to go there and minister your values in the Nadler family reunion. Do they care about it? Not yet, but I have hope. And so I, I will minister to family members, not on the basis of old relationships I had with them. I still have a brother who remembers me when I was a very little boy. He's 17 years my senior. He remembers when I was little. He says, are you showering? Yes, I shower. <laughs> but I don't relate to him as his kid brother. I'm there to minister the grace of God to him. I'm there to plead with him to be saved. Every time I talk, I'm pleading with him to be saved. I keep telling him, Jerry, you don't have any time. <laughs> yeah, you got one foot on the train and one foot on the platform, brother. You're about to, you got to trust in Messiah now. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> In other words, in my family, I have a whole new family, a whole new mishpucha. Uh, you are my mishpucha, and I represent your values as well when I'm talking to my fleshly family. And you say, well, does this help? Uh, well, I don't get invited to as many funerals and marriage and weddings as I used to, but still, uh, I pray for them like crazy. And so in our, regarding the greater Jewish community, I, I am a Jew, I'm part of the Jewish community, I am Israel, I am part of it. But I interact with the greater Jewish community as the king of the Jews directs me to, to, uh, to interact with them. As I share his good news with the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And therefore, uh, and following him, uh, we, go out, we go out to him outside the camp, as I have up on the screen from Hebrews chapter 13. Uh, I therefore live as a Jew, as God's kind of Jew. Uh, to share God's message with my people or my family or whoever else there may be. And so, uh, as Abraham left for Messiah, so do we, as we leave the camp following him, uh, bearing his reproach as it is. Why? Because we don't have a lasting city here, but we're seeking a city which is to come, as the scripture says there. And so Abraham was under a new authority, a new authority. Your father's house refers to your father's authority. Uh, as you can see here, uh, the, the distinction made, Psalm 45, 10, and 11. Read with me the upper left hand of the screen. Let's read that together. Here we go. Forget your people and your father's house, and the king will desire your beauty since, uh, since he is your Lord. I messed it up writing this morning, but never mind there. But understand the issue. He's your Lord, and therefore forget your father's house. What? You want to honor your father and mother, but you're under new authority. You're under new authority. And so Abraham was now under new authority, as we'll see. Abraham now went as Adonai led him. Uh, God's word was now his path. Uh, the, the, the called are under new authority. Yeshua is my Lord. Uh, Yeshua who Adon, Yeshua is Lord. Uh, and therefore his will be done in my life. Uh, and therefore if I have believed on his sacrifice and if I've been set apart, then I live for his will alone. If I'm unsure of whether I believed on him or not, 
that will see, be seen in how I follow him. That'll be seen in my lackadaisical approach to honoring God and living for God. And so what about marriage? Well, listen, in marriage, for this reason, for this cause, a man will leave his father and his mother and cleave unto his wife. If for marriage you leave your father's house, how much more for Messiah? If one is so, the other is even greater. And so understand we love the Lord our God with all our heart and soul and might. We therefore live that out with a new authority accordingly. And so God had brought, uh, had initially brought the family from Ur of the Chaldees to Haran. Uh, and then Abraham left his father there. He let, why? Because his father wasn't going to press to the mark. He left his father in Haran. Uh, he was going to live, his father, uh, Terah, would live, Terah would live another 60 years, but nonetheless, he had to leave, because that's exactly what God was saying to him. He had to leave him there and go on to Canaan for the sake of his own soul. Go for yourself. Go for your soul. You have to do what God called you to do for the sake of your soul. You may need to leave family members behind and whoever else who will resist the calling of God, who says no to God. But we need to press on to the mark of a high calling. Though no one else shall follow, still I will follow the Messiah. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. This is how we roll in our congregation. For those who believe him and set apart for God, his fellowship, and his plan. Uh, fell, finally, and I'm going to finish this point, so bear with me. Finally, surrendered to God's call, he was shown by faith. For it says there, to the land which I will show you, God had to show him. It wasn't based on what he could see. And so I have there a map of where he went as he went from Ur up to Haran and then uh, down, of course, down to uh, the land, which would eventually have a Jerusalem, but nonetheless. And so the land Eretz he left to be replaced with the land God has shown. Only if you leave, uh, only what you left, therefore, you have what God has given. What? If you will die to yourself, if you will die to your... Paul says, 1 Corinthians 15, 31, I die daily. If you will die to yourself, to your own preferences, if you will die to all the possessions that possess you, if you will die to all the preferences you have, if you'll die to yourself, God will replace it with something greater and eternal. God has better for you. If you will trust in him, depend on him. God has better for you. And this is what we need to understand in light of, of Abraham. Uh, he would be given what God has for him. Uh, not because uh, you may not have, you say, well, I'm not sure what I have. What have you let go from? Have you separated yourself from those matters that we talked about? Are you still clinging to those matters of the world? Love not the world nor the things of the world. For those who love the world, the love of the Father dwells not in him. And therefore, you want to understand that the world has this pull upon you. You need to see it for what it is, as a, a substitute, a poor substitute for what God has for you. And therefore, you need to see my time, my talent, my treasure. Uh, how have I been living for him? How do I honor him through it all? Have I left behind and God is now provided in its place? I live for him through all these things. And so therefore, as we left uh, the land of Egypt, uh, we had to exit in order to enter. There had to be this separation uh, for sanctification. There had to be recognizing when I'm sanctified unto the Lord, I've been se separated uh, from the old self and putting on the new self, Yeshua, uh, and getting rid of, therefore, the old self, the old loyalty, the old community, the old authority, as I live for him and him alone. And so God, therefore, says, I will show you. It wasn't, listen, it wasn't based on what Abraham would see. It's based upon what God will show. You say, what? It would be by revelation. Canaan was always there. But it wasn't until God showed him that it became a promised land. God wants to show you as well. 
See, some of you are waiting what you can experience, what you can do on your own. I want to see it before I believe it. No, God wants you to believe it that you might then be shown. They can reveal it to you. He therefore will reveal to you if you'll trust in him. That's faith. We trust in him. We have, we are, you know, we walk by faith, not by sight. And therefore we have what he has shown us. We go, we go ahead with him in this regard. But if you haven't separated yourself, you're not going to be seeing what God wants to show you. And therefore, those areas where you're confused about, those things you can't understand, the things you can't grasp, the things he hasn't revealed, are areas that you haven't separated yourself from. Do you see what the story is saying here? As he separated himself, so he was shown there are things God has for you to encourage your heart, to strengthen you and guide you and direct you. If you will say, I will follow Yeshua with all my heart, my soul, and my life, and all that I have. If we've been delivered from the domain of darkness and transformed to the king of his son, then this is all true for us as he's guiding us, directing us, as we look to his glory and his glory alone. And so therefore, the same finished work that secured your salvation is the same finished work that secures the land for the Jewish people. He fulfilled all the promises. He fulfilled all the promises. If the land... Uh, ends for the Jewish people, you say it's no longer, then the salvation ends for you. And therefore his death is meaningless. But I'm here to declare to you that his death is everything. It is the finished work for our soul. In him you are complete. For in him you are secure. You are secure based on the promises of God, not on your works. Therefore, Israel is in the land. It is securely their land based on the promises of God, the same promises that we depend on as well. And therefore, uh, we have a security issue with guarding these matters. You say, what do you mean? Uh, by faith. And by faith in Messiah. Have you been delivered from the domain of darkness? Have you been delivered? Have you trusted in him? You see, as soon as you trust in him, as soon as you trust in his finished work, his sacrifice, at that moment, you are delivered. And therefore you go. Therefore you can say no to those things that habituated your life. Those things that you were addicted to. Those things you depended upon. Uh, God has a whole new life for you. You're set free for the moment you believe on him. Trust in God and look to him. And therefore, have you taken off the old self and put on the new self with a new loyalty, new community, new authority? Is it seen your time, your talent, your treasure, your relationships? Have you done that yet? That may be an area to pray about. And therefore, because of the, pr the Prince of Peace, may his name be blessed, you have peace with God because of the Prince of Peace, because of what Messiah has done. Therefore, will you pray for the peace of Jerusalem? Will you pray for the Jewish people? Will you stand by Israel because of the word of God, because of the promises of God? Will you therefore trust God for all of these matters and therefore speak, to, speak truth to power to those who are naysayers and say to them, no, the word of God is true. Yeshua died for my sins, was raised from the dead. Therefore, the land belongs to the Jewish people, just like heaven belongs to me. And God's people said, amen, amen, and amen, amen, and amen. Let's bring it all before the Lord in prayer right now. Father, we are a thankful people because of who you are. And therefore, your word is true because you are a God who cannot lie. You are trustworthy. Your word is truth. It is a lamp unto our feet. The word of God is our path. For the living word is our savior. And now we ask that you might fill us with your spirit, that we might be your instrument of grace and good news, that we'll be firm in the truth of God and therefore declaring the truth to others. That your name may be glorified in us even as we declare your trustworthiness and your faithfulness. And Lord, there may be someone here right now who has not yet personally trusted in Messiah, who is not, who's still living in fear and guilt and anger and all those things that control them. Oh Lord, we pray for them. We don't want to see them live this way. We want them to have the freedom and the new life in Messiah. Draw them to yourself. And if you're here, uh, whether you're live streaming or with us in this building, if you're here and you have not yet personally trusted in Yeshua, regardless of what religious ceremonies you've gone through, whatever irreligious things you've done, if you'll just trust in Yeshua's sacrifice for you now, you will be delivered. 
from the domain of darkness and transformed, transferred into the kingdom of his beloved son. Right now, by simply trusting, he will deliver you from those habits. He will deliver you from those excuses as well. And therefore, pray with me this simple prayer. Dear God, forgive me for my selfishness, for my fears, for my anger. Cleanse away all my sin through the atonement of Messiah. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. Lord, I thank you for those who trust in you this very moment, who depend on you right now for new life. Help us to grow as a community, as families, individuals, to the glory of your name. And we say, Am Yisrael Chai, because the God of Israel lives. And it's in his name we give thanks. And all of God's people said, Amen, amen. If you prayed that prayer with me, uh, Mike will be at the table at the information desk. Let him know you prayed that prayer. We'll give you information to help you grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. Would you stand with me as we sing the national anthem of Israel, Hatikva, as we stand in solidarity with the state of Israel. <laughs> Nefesh Yehudi Homiya Ulfa'at Mizrach Kadima Ayan Letzion Sophia Od Lo Avda Tikvateinu Atik va bachnot al paim, liotam chovshi beyad zenu eretzion virushalayim, liotam chovshi beyad zenu. Eretz Zion, Virushalayim. Some of you don't even know what that means, so let's read it together. As long as still within the inmost heart a Jewish spirit sings, and as long as the eye looks eastward, gazing towards Zion, our hope is not lost. That 2,000-year hope to be a free people in our land land of Zion and Jerusalem.